We haven't started yet, by the way, we're just chatting. Um, so, for those who are just newly arrived, far away. Okay, so I would really like to have a much better understanding of projection than I currently do. Of projection? Yes. Well, I... pretty much every time you don't feel an emotion that's really within you, you're automatically projecting it anyway. So most of us are walking projection units, you could say, because there's, there's a lot of emotions that we're holding onto within us, and every one of those emotions gets projected onto the universe. So, um, but, but a lot of that is sort of unconscious projection, in the sense that we're not aware because we, we have yet to really come to terms with that particular emotion or even, be, even acknowledge that that particular emotion exists within us. But... Um, but with um, the kind of projection I was talking about is just rage and anger, which is an overt projection of your emotion. So every time you go into rage or anger or resentment, hatred, all of those kind of emotions, you are now conscious that you're trying to change something in your external environment. You're, you're trying to manipulate your external environment. You're trying to change other people and blame, or blame other people for how you feel. So that's a very overt form of projection. So you could say there's really two forms of projection of your emotion. One is when you're basically just sitting on the emotion, fairly unconscious about what the emotion is, and, and find yourself just sitting on it, sitting on it, sitting on it, and you're not even wanting to be aware, perhaps, at that point, um, and you're just sitting on an emotion. Well, that's when you project to the universe the most, but you're totally unconscious of it. Um, and when I say project the most, that's when you're sitting on an emotion like that, you're basically just projecting that emotion outward to the universe in an unconscious manner, but also it's undirected. There's no direction in it. It's not a specific person generally that you're picking out to project at, but rather it's just mankind and the world in general and the universe in general receives the emotion from you without, without you really being aware. And this is why a lot of animals, for example, don't automatically come up and sit on our shoulder or, or all of those kind of things because, because in the end they can feel our projection and they're afraid of it, even though we're not aware that it's coming out of us. So that's one form of projection. The other form is when you really know what you're upset or you know who you're upset with and you, you just project all of what you can project at that person whether that be neediness or whether it be anger or rage, resentment, hatred, oftentimes we know exactly what we're doing under those. So if you can imagine the entire audience here, the more, more we sit on our emotion, we're just naturally projecting it to the universe, but we're not aware of it and everybody is basically receiving it. But we can single out a person in the audience and if everyone in this audience projected rage at that one person, then you would know the difference in terms of the feelings inside of you as to the difference between those two states. That's very, very different than an audience just projecting what they're sitting on compared to actively trying to change something that's in their external environment. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. There, there were a couple of levels. Like, you were doing a talk one day, and it was in Budrum, yep. and you were doing it in a very humorous vein, almost rhetorical, and you were saying things like, um, you're all catalyzed by me being AJ, this crazy guy that comes along and talks about the divine love path and everything, and I'm sitting there in my head and I'm going, no we don't, <laughs> like, and almost arguing with you all the way, and then I realized what I was doing. It's like I was being really negative about something that you were doing in a very light-hearted vein yep. that I was resisting in some way. Yeah. So would that be projecting? Of course. Yeah, okay. There's also, whenever you say, no, you don't, when you do, that's also a projection. <laughs> a projection, okay. um, So a lot of people, uh, when I talk with them, they, uh, they often uh, feel quite confronted, right, about whatever the subject is on. And, and so they often say, look, no, I don't feel that. And I say, well, I'm sorry, but I can feel that from you. So, so that is certainly within you. And there'll be times in your future where you become more and more sensitive emotionally, more and more open, and the more open and sensitive you become, the more exact you can pinpoint another person's emotion and what they're actually, you know, sitting on inside of themselves. Um, so, for example, with the, the uh, is AJ Jesus question, 
If many of you had resolved it, you would be acting entirely differently than what you currently are. Does that make sense? Um, you, your actions prove whether you resolve questions or not in, at the soul level. At the soul level, when you resolve a question, it's like that question no longer exists anymore. There's no doubt in you anymore, You're, and it changes your entire life. So, for example, if all of, or if all of you here were aware at the soul level that there's nothing to be afraid of with death, right? then most of you would no longer have any fear of any type. right? Any type at all. So you wouldn't be afraid of people being nasty to you, you wouldn't be afraid of people wanting to torture you, you wouldn't be afraid of any of those things once you've fully resolved the question of what happens when you die, for example. So, so when you fully resolve a question, your actions and the way in which you live your life completely changes in, in almost every question you can consider. So let's, let, have we fully resolved the question as to whether there's a God? Well, you will fully resolve that question once you become at one with God. Does that make sense? You're not going to fully resolve that question before then. You can think that it's fully resolved, right? But, but there are still many blocks and there will be times when you'll go through your doubts, when you, when you have doubts and feelings that, oh, maybe it's not right, maybe it's all just a dream, maybe it's all just utopian presentation, maybe everything AJ's speaking of is just like somebody's come up with a perfect world scenario and then, then talked about it, you know, that kind of thing. And, uh, and so we haven't often at that point really resolved whether there's a God or not. Um, what happens to the human soul at death? Same sort of thing. If we have really resolved that, we would have far less fear, a far more desire. We would never act in a, in a place that's negative with regard to desire. We would always just pursue our desire no matter what the results. So m most of us don't do that, do we? What we do is we go, oh, I'm afraid that I'm not going to get enough money. And so now, and that's related ironically to the question of whether we've resolved the issue of death or not, believe it or not. Because if, if we had resolved the issue of death and we had also resolved the issue of abundance, we would no longer worry about getting money and we would no longer prostitute ourselves with our desires to get money automatically. So when you fully resolve something within yourself, it makes a huge difference to your entire life. And that's why I say to you that you have not fully resolved the issue even as to whether I'm Jesus or not. And I understand that. I'm not saying you do, do have to resolve it. But when you do resolve it, it'll change your actions. Even your actions with me will be changed by that. It's because it, I understand what you're saying completely. Because even when you want to believe it 100%, you, you know inside that there's still doubts yep. and moments when... And wanting to believe is very, very different than believing. Uh, and believing is very, very different to knowing. Right? When you know... Uh, for certain, there's a whole difference. So for many of you, what's happened is that you suspect I am Jesus, <laughs> if we could put it that way. Um, you suspect because of the things I've taught over the two years and all these different truths that you've heard as a result and all those kind of things. You suspect that I, that I am the person I'm claiming to be, but there's still a lot of doubts involved and there's still a lot of influence in your personal life uh, that would tend to indicate that you don't really believe it. So, for example, many times I can feel a projection of the audience from something that I do. You know, um, to give you an example, I, I think in a talk or two ago, I mentioned that myself and Mary went to McDonald's. Right? <laughs> and I could feel from the audience a lot of judgment about that. Right? And uh, you were one of them, really. <laughs> A lot of judgment about that. Well, uh, to be honest, what I had was uh, a chai. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but, uh, but we also had to go to the toilet. So, that, you know, McDonald's is an ideal place for that. Thank you, McDonald's, uh, for that. Uh, when you're travelling, isn't it, sometimes? Um, and so, but the, because you hear it from me, you can go, automatic judgment, right? It's automatic. Oh, would Jesus be doing this? Oh, I don't know. You know, AJ's doing the wrong thing there. And a lot of your personal issues come up and, and, and you will resolve a lot of those issues over time, obviously. And you'll also look at my actions with you in a completely different light once you resolve them. So it just takes time to do all of that, to resolve all of those things. Yeah. So, by the way, we're just having an informal chat at the moment because uh, I haven't started on the subject that I was going to talk to you. 
this is just. Yeah. I just want to ask one last sure, question. Sure, sure, fire. So, uh, since Friday, I I developed a migraine yep. that, that came and went. I watched something on Facebook that was a very intense German documentary about car accidents yep. that was quite triggering. I had hoped that I would cry more than I did. It was quite horrific, and I felt the horror in my body, but still couldn't cry. And headache came and went, and then last night we watched a movie called Gone Baby Gone, which yep. was very triggering as well. And I went to bed with, and I've got this pain up the back of my head, and I think it's fear. My, my sense is that it's fear. A pain in the back of your head or front of you? No, in the back of my head. Just the, the whole thing that I am resisting in some way, yep. I think is a terror of fear. Yep. So I find at times like that, I tend to think a lot about the divine love path, and I would think a lot about you. I'd be thinking of things that you've said and the mind, the tapes would be going and everything. Yep. When I'm doing that, am I projecting at you as well? Is that... <laughs> Firstly, can I just say, don't worry about projecting at me, <laughs> like whether you're doing it or not. Um, the truth is, we've got to remember that most of us are automatically projecting at, at the entire universe with every single emotion we're in denial of. So every time we're in a denial of an emotion, yes, we are projecting that to the universe. Whenever you think of me, there is a projection coming at me. Now, sometimes those thoughts might be nice. And so I receive them as sort of a loving projection. Other times those thoughts are not so nice and you're angry and frustrated with me and you feel annoyed with me, annoyed that you ever met me and those kind of feelings. And, and those feelings I also feel uh, as a projection. So, so as an unloving projection. So it just, um, and the truth is that so does everyone else who you project at, feel things in that way. It's just that the, least, the less sensitive we become to the emotions of others, um, the more difficult it is for us to be sensitive about the projection. So in other words, we don't feel the projection as much. Um, the, key, the key is, in every case, to focus more on the actual processing side of the emotion. So, so you know, for example, that you've got... Better make sure this is a whiteboard marker. I think it is. Yes. Okay. So you know that you've got your causal grief, right? So. Then you've got your fear, which is usually begun in childhood. And then you've got the denial process of your fear, which usually is the suppression of your fear, uh, which is usually done through anger, but it can also be done through shame. Uh, like, obviously, other emotions also suppress fears. Right? So, so when, when you go into the process of, of having a migraine headache, most of the time you are suppressing grief, right? So, so if you bear that in mind, every time you get a migraine, you're suppressing grief, not so much fear. Now, there has to be a reason why, you're, there must be a capping emotion, a emotion over the top of the grief that does not allow the grief to flow. And so that, that emotion will be based around the fear, usually. And it can range from anything from terror through to just, just a doubt of some kind that stops you from processing. So, for example, if I doubt that I'm ever going to release my grief, then there's a high likelihood that I won't release my grief in that moment. Does that make sense? Just the process of doubting that I'm ever going to be able to do it causes a suppression of the grief. When I'm terrified, obviously, now, now there's huge things stopping us. Now, in a few weeks' time, uh, myself and Mary will probably do a chat together about some things uh, we've been discussing about Mary's uh, processing that we feel will probably benefit everyone too about terror and grief. So mo most people live here, live in this place, live in the place of fear. So, so one of the reasons why emotional processing is so difficult is because most people don't get below their fears. They live in it, they think their fears are true. Right? If you think about it, most of us believe our fears are true. Most of us believe our fears can't ever be overcome, generally. And most of us spend all of our life trying to work around the fears that are inside of us. And, uh, and so we live in the place of fear, which is a very damaging place to live, permanently, uh, certainly. And, and if you live in your fear, your fear builds up, it becomes like a wall, like a, like a brick wall. So if you think of fear as false expectations appearing real, 
really from God's perspective, fear is nothing. Like, if you, if you live in a perfectly harmonious universe that's harmonious with love, which is what God has created, then in the end, the fear that is in you even, from God's perspective, shouldn't be there. And that fear is actually nothing from God's perspective. It doesn't really exist. It only exists because of what's happened to us in our life that we're not released. And so what happens for, mo for the majority of us, like we believe our fear is this mountain. That's what we believe. So we see our fear as this huge mountain that, that every time we go to do certain things, where if we have a fear of those particular things, we automatically stop ourselves from acting upon uh, our desires. So you can think of your desires as your pathway home, if you like, and then every fear is like a block to your pathway home, and every fear really doesn't exist. From God's perspective, it's not real. So every time you treat it as real, you make it bigger. So if you say to yourself, for example, or you feel, I can't do it because I'm terrified. Like I'm, for example, I'm terrified to talk to a group of people. Many of us have that terror within us, right? Where we would feel very nervous about getting up in front of a group of people. So, so every time you don't allow yourself to confront that fear, that fear has another stone put on top of it, if you like. So it has another, it reinforces itself. And so what happens is every time I act in my fear, I reinforce my fear. My fear becomes bigger. And every time I reinforce it again, it becomes bigger, reinforce it again. And the way I reinforce my fear is by believing my fear is to be true. That's how I reinforce my fears. And if I reinforce my fears like that, the fear just keeps getting bigger, 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 bigger. And every time I come up, I try to follow my desire, if this fear is in the way, I'll just come up to the point of the fear, get so terrified, and I won't want to do anything after that. I'll turn around and try to do something else after that because I'll be so terrified about overcoming the fear. And every time I'm terrified, ironically, my fear is bigger again. Does that make sense? Is everyone? So every time you honour your fear, you're out of harmony with love. But I never honour my fears at all. I admit to them, like, I am afraid of whatever, but honouring them is now living in them. And when you honour them and you now believe them to be true, now things are very, very dangerous from that point. You'll do all sorts of things to get to alleviate your fear in that point. So, so and, and what happens then is spirits, in answer to your question, so spirits then can hook into my fear. And many of the headaches people get from the back of their skull are about spirits actually uh, hooking in. So, so sad spirits hooking into your own terror about your own sadness. Does that make sense? And they exacerbate or grow that terror of your own sadness within you. So you start getting a headache, but the headache comes from the back more than from the front. So most of your migraines will generally start in the front area of your, of your, of your head. The stuff that starts at the back is definitely spirit influence. But again, you've got to look at, all right, there's a denial of sadness within me you see that then the spirit i'm afraid of my i'm terrified of my own sadness and now i've got a group of spirits around me who are attracted to me who are also all terrified of their own sadness and they project at me you know suppress sadness suppress sadness and they're trying to suppress their own sadness through this process as well which then just causes worse problems for us in our in our head usually in terms of it aching and, and eventually we can get migraines from our suppression of our sadness in that way. Yeah. Okay. If we can have a microphone, just, just, just a hand it back there, thanks. Hi everyone, my name is Linda and I came down from Townsville to do the workshop with Tristan. Now I'm sitting here, so that means I was asked to leave yesterday afternoon. Right. Yep. And um, I'm feeling very, very sad and um, confused. Um, I, I believe that this workshop was an opportunity for us to um, learn how to get into our emotions. Mm -hmm. And um, I was told that I was too needy of help. So if you could give me some... Too needy? Too needy of wanting help. 
wanting help. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And um, this is one of a, ma a major block that most people have that relates to their fear. And every time you get too needy in a workshop that that somebody is running, if they're running it in, the, in harmony with divine love, they will probably ask you to leave. And the reason why is neediness is actually a projection onto other people that they have to help you because you don't want to take full responsibility yourself for all of your own emotions. So the, remember one of the core principles of receiving divine love is to take personal responsibility for our life. That means taking personal responsibility for everything just between you and God. So every time you project neediness onto somebody else that they help you, that is actually um, unbeknown to ourselves generally at the time. It's quite an angry approach to your own emotional injuries. The reason why is no one has to help you. And in fact, God created a universe that nobody has to actually help you in anything you desire to do whatever that thing is. Nobody has to actually help you. And they can actually be loving you, not helping you uh, as well. So have a look, I, what I would do if I was yourself, is I'd have a look at my reasons why I need other people to help me so much. The irony is that when we project a need at other people to help, Generally, we want what's really being projected most of the time is a need for them to share in my emotions. So, in other words, I want them to understand me and to help me and to share my experience and commiserate with me. Now, those emotions are actually very damaging emotions to other people because what it does firstly is it takes us away from our own emotions. It also really is saying to other people that you are responsible for what's inside of me. And that's not the case either. And the heavier you become need, the more and more you become needy, the stronger that emotion becomes, it will actually in the end turn into anger. And, and if you allow yourself to connect to the anger part of it, you'll be able to release the neediness quite easily and, and then go along to another workshop and it will probably be very beneficial for you in that space. But it's very important to let go of the desire for other, the, the neediness of other people helping you for whatever, for whatever reason. And there are often like hundreds of emotional reasons why we do it. Um, the primary ones, of course, though, are that we feel that we want them to share the experience. And the main reason why we want that is because we don't believe we can do it ourselves. We don't believe we can feel our emotions ourselves. This is amazing because I, I haven't felt anything like that, you know, and I'm just so shocked. Like, Well, um, I don't know, was it Tristan's group you're in? Yep. Well, Tristan, I know, is pretty sensitive emotionally and he would be very keen, like, on assisting any person. So if you can trust that he's feeling something in you that you're not aware of, and allow yourself then to work with that, you'll find you'll probably benefit from it. Whereas if you go down the line and saying, oh, I think he was wrong, um, I, don't, I don't think that's right, what will finish up probably happening is that you'll get caught on this emotion again at another point in time. My suggestion with all of these emotions is, like, a needy-based emotions are just as damaging to yourself and other people as anger-based emotions. Because right? when I have a neediness for you to be involved in my life or in my processing or in you helping me in my, in my relationship with God, firstly, I am not honouring my relationship with God first. Like My relationship with God is the primary relationship. And every time I try to involve you in my emotional processing work, I am no longer honouring that actually the person who can help me all the time with my... With, with, with myself and, and with my relationship with God is God, not, not anyone else really. And then a lot of times our neediness comes across as projections of desiring commiseration. In other words, what we have coming out of us is a desire for other people to please our way of thinking, the way this should happen for us. So often what happens is we have this strong idea in our own mind of how help should be given to us. Does that make sense? Many of, many of you have this with God, actually. 
have a very strong idea of how God should be treating you at any one point in time. And often how God's treating you is very different than how you feel God should be treating you. Right? Now, if we just assume that God is in a state of perfect love, the fact is that when I'm not receiving the love that God has for me, there must be something inside of me that is out of harmony with receiving that love. And my suggestion to you is that Tristan's pointed out something to you that's out of harmony with receiving that love. And, and it's difficult for you to actually see that that's the truth. But the, the answer is, you can do one of two things. You can either continue sort of don't, not believing Tristan and don't bother experimenting with all of that and see whether you receive divine love or not. Or you can start experimenting with that, that neediness and, have, and start looking at the underlying causes and then see whether you receive divine love in that condition or not. So you can actually experiment and find out the truth yourself anyway. I, I thought I had a desire to learn. A, yeah, a desire to learn um, doesn't mean that you don't have a desire, a neediness uh, emotion either. For example, often we have mixed emotions on a lot of different subjects. So you might have a desire to know the truth, all right? but at the same time be very afraid of knowing the truth. And that can often happen right at the same time, can't it? Like, and, and remember I've drawn with you in the past a, a scale, there was a desire scale and there was a there was a fear and truth scale. The thing that gets rid of fear is the truth. And it, when, when our fear is lower than our desire, that's when we'll do something fully. So, so many of us have a desire to know the truth, but we are afraid of knowing personal truth. Now in that state, our desire is down here and our fear is up here. What will happen is no emotional flow and we won't progress very rapidly in that state. So, so don't assume that you don't have a desire to know truth just because somebody's saying you're needy. Does that make sense? Just, just hone in on that particular emotion that's being identified rather than saying, but, but I, you know, I do want to change. and I do, Rather than going down that track, and, and I don't feel that Tristan said you don't because you, the whole thing of you rocking up means that you do there's an automatic assumption that you do but there's obviously some other emotions that prevented him he felt from helping you at that particular time does that make sense and if you deal with those emotions you'll actually be able to receive more help if you allow yourself to work through those emotions but don't don't assume that just because you have asked there, there have been some that have been asked to, to leave from the workshops and quite a number have been asked to leave from the workshops don't assume that that means that, that you don't have any desire or that you don't have any desire for God or any desire for truth, because I, I feel you do. You wouldn't even be here listening if you didn't. However, in, an, in a workshop situation, what they're trying to do is to show you how, what is blocking your relationship with God. And if that particular thing blocking your relationship with God is affecting anyone else in the workshop, now they have a duty of care of anyone in the workshop, of everyone else in the workshop, that something has to be done about it. So if, if a person's helping you individually, that's very, very different to a person helping you in a group setting on the divine love path. Because in a group setting, if I'm helping you in a group setting, I need to be mindful of everyone else in the group as well as you. And I also need to be mindful of what emotion you might be projecting at everyone else in the group. And I need to be mindful also of what spirits are with you hooking into that emotion that you're projecting with the group. And I need to be sensitive to all of those things. And, and if I'm sensitive to all of those things, I'll notice anything out of harmony and immediately stop it so that it doesn't affect everyone else. So, so some of you, if you're just sitting there quietly, avoiding everybody and avoiding everything, which by the way is not a recommended way of action, but if you do that, um, you probably won't get removed from a group, from a workshop, but the workshop won't benefit you at all either, right? If you allow yourself to fully engage and fully engage the process, which means fully engage also hearing what people say to you and feeling about that, if you fully engage that process, then things can change quite rapidly. And I suggest that Tristan felt 
that you weren't fully engaging the process because of the emotion of neediness. And so my suggestion is to have a look at that for yourself, yeah. rather than just shut everything down. So, so it's what some do is they get told one thing and then they go, all right, that's it, uh, I've had enough of all of that, I'm not doing that anymore, shut it all down, bang. And, and before you know it, they're off you know, doing something else instead and then regretting down the track their decision. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Just straight back. Um, I just want to comment on this sense of neediness. Um, I had approached you and Mary at one time and um, as I stood there boiling away because I felt rejected, um, you finally capped it by totally ignoring it and I went home and I felt very rejected and totally like um, there must be a message in this but I felt really bad yep. and just to cut it short I haven't totally processed it because I'm still getting dreams but it changed my life and I said I said to someone I think it was the the kindest and most loving thing that you and Mary did to me um, it made me um, realise, even though I keep saying I'm aware of my neediness, I'm aware that I'm asking and thinking and hoping for help because I feel quite damaged, um, it, it really made it sink in deeper and I turned to God and I said, well, I was a bit angry and I'm going, well, damn them, I'll go and talk to God then, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I knew that I was... Um, that this was a message for me and in, in communicating with God I have a deeper, um, a deeper understanding and the feeling that yeah it is about me and God and it is wonderful that I can get help when it does come but that need and the demand that I was projecting and doing um, had to stop somewhere yeah. And, yeah. And, and it changed a lot of the way I feel and try to process um, because I get quite stuck yeah. and, and now when I'm stuck I, I don't beat myself up quite as bad and I do talk a lot to God and I'll just go into this state of saying I'm really stuck and just carry on about this and then I pray and then I'll I'll just, and then it's something that happens is that just by not being so demanding, something sinks deeper. And though I don't get to the cause, so much more sensitivity about what happened to me and who I actually am not because of these things is starting to occur. So yep. I can't say that I'm really progressing in terms of getting to it, but it's just eliminating the blocks that I haven't been aware of yeah. and becoming sensitive to it. Yeah. But to do that, I had to realise my communication is really with God and I have to, and this is how I feel, really get that connection yeah. and the help around me is wonderful, but that connection is it. Yeah, you and know. in the end, even if you were the only person on the planet, God can still help you in that space. So you don't need to have the help of everyone else. But it's obviously lovely to have help. But one of the things you pointed out is that neediness is actually a demand. And that's very true. And in fact, in fact, the proof is you don't, just for a moment, you write down a list of all the people who have been needy with you over the last, say, three months. Right, write down those people. And then for the next two months, focus on not supplying their need and see how much anger comes your way as a result, right? And you'll find actually that lots of anger will come your way as a result of that. And what that proves is that neediness is actually coming from, a, 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 from an angry place. And, and in fact, it's the anger driving the neediness. And whenever the neediness doesn't get satisfied by your, somebody in your environment, then if we get angry, that demonstrates to ourselves that we are demanding of them and demanding of someone isn't a loving space. So it's not acting in harmony of love when we demand. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's a very good thing to bear in mind. Thanks, Lolly. And there was a question over here, if we could have a microphone down in this direction. 
Thanks, AJ. This actually follows on a bit from Suzanne's question earlier. Um, I've just come back from a couple of weeks away with my kids and I awesome. have <laughs> oh, yeah, huge amounts of triggers. And what I found, though, was that I, um, I wouldn't allow myself to process the emotions fully. In fact, hardly at all, unless I was completely on my own. Right. And what I, what I found was that there were a few people that we stayed with where the, you know, now I seem to be getting more and more sensitive to people's energy. Yeah. And a few people we stayed with, the energy was really, really dark. Yeah. And I found it really hard to deal with. Yeah. And what, what I'm finding is When you that say dark, what was the feelings you were feeling? Just... Oh, a lot of fear, you know, like it comes back to this living in fear thing. Yeah. And um, what, I, what I found was that, you know, it's so easy to, to walk this path when you're surrounded by people on the divine love path yeah. who understand and are accepting of you all of a sudden becoming a blubbering mess, yeah. you know. Yeah. But it's really, really difficult when you're surrounded with people who... And I know I have a huge, a lot of stuff to process around judgment, yeah. both judgment yeah. of others and my own judgment of other people yeah. and their judgment of me. Yeah. But my question would be, you know, like, how, how do you progress through that? I mean, it's very tempting just to shut everybody out and just stick with the divine love community. But that's not really helpful either to myself or to other people, is it? Yeah, well, I suppose when you're in the real world, shall we call it, um, or the unreal world, perhaps I'd like to call it, when you're in the unreal world, the world of mankind, the beauty of being in that place uh, is that any emotions you have unhealed inside of yourself will be exposed through your law of attraction. So, um, so it gets quite intense at times here, here on the earth as a result of the whole world of mankind being in an unhealed emotional place and then, of course, when you're living in that world, you can easily be, um, you know, tri triggered by them emotionally. All of your unhealed emotions, in other words, are going to get exposed. Now, I think that's a wonderful thing myself, uh, rather than a bad thing. Um, so the problem with living in a divine love community 100% of the time is that uh, unless everyone in that community is completely and frankly open and honest with each other and also um, which, which obviously no matter what their condition is achievable but it's very difficult depending on their condition and um, what can happen is things can change quite rapidly in a divine love community as well like so that that can be done but there are times when everyone around you is actually more loving than what your law of attraction is indicating you need to have triggered for example um, many of you still have quite a lot of fear of being attacked personally. Is that not the case? Like fear of personal attack. Uh, whether that be physical in nature, or like in other words, physical pain as a result of it, or just verbal abuse, like people abusing you verbally. Now, um, if you lived in a community of, with other people on the Divine Love Path, it's very rare that such an event would ever occur to trigger that emotion. In other words, you'd feel quite safe and secure. After a while, sometimes we can feel that we're in a place that we're not really in as a result of that because everyone around us is treating us a certain way. But now when we put ourselves in the world um, and we live you know, for two weeks, if you like, in our law of attraction, now that will come up daily often. And uh, my suggestion is to go along with it and, and allow yourself to make the step into feeling your emotions while it's happening. And it's a great thing if you can learn to do that. If you can learn to feel your emotions while they're happening, doesn't matter who you're in front of or what's going on, if you can do that, what happens is there's this switch that happens inside of yourself where you're, uh, you're loving yourself more and you're allowed to be yourself at every moment. And because of that, it, you no longer feel the need for to, to be in a sort of a, an environment that's all protected like a little cocoon for you to exist in. Well, I found that what I was doing was I, would, I think I was feeling and I was aware of some of the emotions that were coming up, but I wasn't allowing myself to process the emotions, uh, except for those times when my law of attraction insisted yeah. that I do that. So have but a look at your fear of other people's belief about your emotions. 
because this began at a very young age and it's one of our emotions we do need to release. One of our fears, one of our blocking emotions we need to release is, is if I cry in front of others, they will judge me and most likely, by the way, they will. Right? And the key is we've got to get to a stage where we honour ourselves so much that that doesn't matter. Do, do you know what I mean? Where we honour ourselves so much that we're allowed to cry if other people are around. You know? The other big emotion that came up for me while we were away was when we stayed with my youngest daughter. Um, that she's out on a property out from Blackhall. And, um, you know, my husband, who's my soulmate, is absolutely in his element in that world. And I just felt so out of place. I was like, you know, how, how do you ever get to that point of, of having the same desires when they're so vastly different? Well, the truth is, if, if you are soulmates, eventually you will end up with the same desires. And if you don't have the same desires now, there is usually two things going on. One is that, uh, is that he is yet to tune in with his desire, in your case. The other is that you're yet to choose in, tune in with yours. <laughs> it's right? both, I think. Cause, yeah. Exactly. And when you learn to honour your own desires and passions fully and still love the other wherever they are, You'll find the other, if they will be drawn, if their desires and passions are the same, they'll be drawn to your desires and passions anyway. So, for example, when I first went, met Mary, um, and I was, I was going around uh, Europe at the time uh, having talks like this, right? And, um, and Mary was quite, like, challenged by that. She, she felt she didn't want to uh, have any public interaction um, she felt that she didn't want to. She wanted. She was so afraid of her own emotions that were coming up, and people were automatically asking a question. Was you? You imagine, like, for five years I've been doing this prior, and then so most people who meet me know that at least I'm claiming to be Jesus, right? Now Mary's there with me. First time I've had a woman with me for five years, right? And I've been saying that uh, I've been waiting for my soulmate. So there's this automatic assumption from everyone we met, oh, you must be Mary. You must be Mary Magdalene, right? And Mary, would, because of her own emotions that she had already processed, would have to admit that she, she felt that way, but, but she didn't want to admit that. She didn't want to do any of that public stuff, right? And so what happened was that it, her fear became so great that it suppressed all of her desires, all of them. So she, she went into this place of total shutdown where she no longer was attracted to me, she felt she wasn't attracted to the divine love path, she felt that she didn't want to feel any of her emotions, and she felt that uh, she wasn't attracted to talk talking to groups of people about the truth. Now, two years later, Mary's worked through a lot of those fears, and she, on her own back, started a whole series of workshops, putting herself in front of people without me, without my influence and still doing it without my influence. So, so that, doesn't that show you in a way that a person can have a whole set of what they feel are their desires at the time that can change very rapidly over a period of time. And that changed mostly because I was following my passion, so I did not compromise my passion. Um, so, so Mary spent quite a lot of time away from me during those two year period because I didn't, follow, I didn't compromise my own passions and desires to help others. Does that make sense? Yeah, so basically I just have to focus on, on me, basically, on my emotions, on processing my emotions and um, recognising my desires and living in my desires. And as I do that, it will then draw him to his but you don't true do self. That, you don't do that and, still, and, and be unloving. Because there's a lot of things you can do when you're following your own passions where you'd completely neglect everyone around you in an unloving way. That's not what I'm suggesting. What I'm suggesting is you still live love yourself, but you follow your passions even when everyone around you feels like you shouldn't have those passions. And I guess that's one, what, what's difficult is when you come from a place of error to be living in your passions and desires and still be living in love because I know I, I, I still have a long way to go before I get to that point of being unconditionally loving towards everyone I meet. Yeah. 
and so that that presents a challenge. It does, and, and so what I um, shortly will be. You'll notice in Mary. I don't know if you've done Mary's workshop, but I think in some of the workshops she's actually handed out. I think it's about a 12-point list of what it means to be on the divine love path, basically. Reminders about, I think I've called it reminders of the divine love path or something. I wrote it six years ago, so I can't quite remember what I called it. But um, in that, um, there are 12 or so points of, of how to stay on the divine love path, um, no matter what's happening around you. And what we'll probably do over the next few months, and we may even do it next uh, weekend up at Butterham, is go through those points um, one by one. Um, just to help people recognise what all the flavour is of the divine love path, what, you know, what, what, it, what it's all about. And one of the things it is about is following your passions and desires no matter what everybody else thinks about you and no matter how everybody else treats you. Right? So, so when they treat you in an unloving manner, and bear in mind unloving manner is trying to control you, shut you down, trying to be being angry and upset with you is an unloving manner. When they treat you in that, it shouldn't change your passions and desires. See, most of us are so used to automatically changing our life to suit the angry person, aren't we? Like, so, so what happens is, you know, you see this happen in a supermarket all the time, don't you? The angriest person gets the most attention, generally, right? You see it happening in families all the time. If you've got three siblings and one of them is more angry than the others, generally they get the most attention. Right? And this is something that we've mostly grown up with, that, that anger is a way to actually get the world to conform to what I want them to do. Now, now that's why anger is ever projected at us. So, so one of the things we have inside of us is a desire to appease anger. And, uh, and this desire comes from our childhood. Whenever we've noticed our parents angry, we automatically know we're not being loved in that place, so we try to help our parents get into a place where they are no longer angry with us, right? And whatever that means, it might mean shutting up when you really want to talk. It might mean you know, eating a meal you don't like. It might mean doing all sorts of things just to appease the anger. And after a while, we learn to respond to anger in a pleasing way. Well, the truth is, on the divine love path, you will learn to respond to anger in totally the opposite way. In other words, you won't get angry, but you will not ever please the person who's angry. You will just stop the process there and then. And so, so that's a part of the learning process of being on the divine love path, learning to deal with the emotion that causes you to appease anger in others and also dealing with the reciprocal emotion, which is, I'll get angry so that you do what I want. You know, there's, that's the reciprocal of it that's within ourselves. And we need to deal with both of those things. Yeah, certainly. Well, what if, you, what if you're not really sure, you know, like so confused around what the passions and desires are? How do you identify those then? Well, there's only one thing that prevents you from knowing your passions and desires, and that is fear. So, so... What, if you can focus on your fear, if you, say, if you say to yourself, well, I don't really know what my passions and desires are. So that's a great acknowledgement to acknowledge that. I don't know what they are. Okay. I don't know what they are because I'm obviously afraid. Because if I wasn't afraid, I'd automatically know what all my passions And I'd probably be automatically doing them right now if I wasn't so afraid. So it's good to have a look at what are you afraid of. Now, the biggest fears generally have nothing to do with physical pain or breaking a leg or falling off of a building or any of those kind of things, the biggest fears are usually always to do what other people will think of you, right? how other people will judge you. Right? That's usually the biggest fears that you'll ever have. And, and so any fear about other people and their judgment of me is going to automatically suppress any desires that I have starting to grow within myself. So one of the things I need to start doing is to realise that every time another person right, projects judgement at me and I respond, I am responding to a false expectation, an expectation in them that is out of harmony with love. So what can only be my result? It can only be an unloving result for me when I do this. 
right? If I can't respond to a projection coming from another person that's out of harmony with love in a manner that's ever going to benefit me positively generally unless I am out of the state of fear and in a loving state myself. Does that make sense? So what's happening with your family is you're, you're very, very worried about how your family judges you when you're feeling an emotion. So that's a fear. You're very worried about being together with your husband and trying to share your life with your husband who you believe is your soulmate. So that's another fear. Does that make sense? Now, what, ha what are happening is these fears are just piling on top of each other. You, if you can think of them like this, here's the wall with its foundation, which, by the way, isn't very strong because no fear foundation is ever strong. But what you're doing is you're placing a, a bricks on top of it every time. So every one of these things, so I'm afraid of how my family feel about me. That's another brick. I'm afraid of losing my husband. That's another brick. You can't ever lose your soulmate, right? Ever. You really can't. Like, at the end of the day sooner or later they're going to come to you <laughs> like you can't ever lose them it's just how long away that is that's the fear you know if it, if it, if it was 20 years and you and you might be apart 20 years most people would go wow you know that's too much for me you know so that's another fear and so what happens is these fears and you see what's happening to the structure the structure is getting big and if this is little old you down here right having a look at that can you see that behind here is your grief but are you going to want to get to that, really? Because you'd be so embroiled in pleasing people here. Does that make sense? And that's what's happening. For, that's why you can't feel your own desires. When you start allowing those fears to be present, you will start actually feeling your desires more fully. The truth is that the majority of us know our desires very well. Right? We know the ones that are harmonious with love and the ones that are out of harmony with love very well, but the majority of us don't follow them because of our fears. And really, for many of us, it's not just fear. It's also like... You know, panic, terror. That's what it really is for the majority. Right? So we're in the state of fear and terror. Thanks. Okay. okay, AJ, I'll try to go over my biggest fear and just try to exercise now what we're talking about. Okay, I personally believe, I mean, I have three options. Either I'm insane or I'm totally overcloaked by spirits at all times since I started that journey or I am at one with God since April. Because, oh, yeah. oh, or I that? am at one with God since April because all I do is talk to people to, I mean, see what's happening, go back home and talk to him all day. I'm exactly there where I was in my entire childhood. And I'm now at the point where I would really, really like my life back because I already missed out on my childhood. I didn't need friends because I didn't, I, I had no friends because I didn't need them because I had all that conversation and that dreams and I was gone. I didn't know. I lost the father when the religion started. And for, I believe now that I was obviously so spiritual and, and, and learned so much about God's laws and whatever. So I was very, very selfish or maybe self-loving. And um, I, I rang my mom. Can you see that you're saying a lot of dual things to me? Like, you're either very selfish or self-loving. Which one is it? Like, you're either okay, at one with I, God. I either I'm the most selfish person on this universe. Yeah. <laughs> because I'm trying to, you know, what is it? But then if I am that, why am I in this room? Then I do not belong here. Because how can the most selfish, I mean, you are the most loving person in this universe. We know that. Well, no, not at the moment. <laughs> but go on. <laughs> well, it's just, look, I, I just lost myself. I, have, I thought I've always had a very strong personality. I had my life 100% under control. But I remember I've I... spoken with you privately about what's going on for you. And, and you, you're saying, you said, you said at the beginning you had three options, right? Yeah, but, totally overclocked by spirits, you say, right? So overclocked by spirit spirits. is one. Yeah. Right. Or insane. Or just, you know, just. Which one? It. What's number two? Insane. Insane. <laughs> right? Or three at one with God. Yeah. 
And instead of me talking, I would very much prefer if you just give me some questions. Can then you, I can give me myself some answers to find out in which see, though, category I belong. Can you see logically, you're almost saying that your condition can only reflect one of these three things. Now, you're really saying that at one with God looks like you're insane or at one with God looks like you're overcloaked. That's what you're really saying. Because you're saying you can't, you can't tell the difference as to which one of these so, you are. When I talk with the Father, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I mean, we go back to the Divine Truth Foundation, which happened, I, I thought we would have a meeting today, that's why I came. That was in April. And I actually had an entire plan written out, sort of what I thought would work. I presented that plan to, Li uh, to Linda and the family down there two days before we met. We met. Yeah. And Linda said to me, oh, that's exactly what AJ is projecting. It's actually good that you went through all that information, you know, that you got all that information. Um, but, you know, that is not loving of you to present something like that because it would, um, you would, for you know, that's just not the way it works. So I decided that's no problem at all. I went home, went through all the motion, went to everything what happened, wrote some letters, which I totally 100% take responsible for it, for its responsibility for it, and I can explain why. Um, can, can you even see? if I did not know that I was writing, because I had to read them again after we had the last What's conversation. happening right now? I don't know. <laughs> What's happening right now is you don't want to know the answer. Because I've already told you the answer in a private conversation. And you don't want to know that answer as to what's going on. You, I'm overclocked. That, that's the answer I've told you. You're a highly mediumistic person who's heavily influenced by spirits the majority of your life, right? And still are, still are heavily influenced by spirits. Now, you also have a lot of pure desires about learning truth. Oh, yeah. So I, please don't say that just because you're overcloaked by a spirit that that means you don't have any positive desires in you because it doesn't mean that. But, but this, this is causing a lot of trouble in your life and has caused a lot of trouble most of your life, this part has. And, and spirits very, very easily hook into you and as a result, you actually have a very firm belief that you're here and not here. You, you, you presented me with three options, but actually what you personally believe is that this one is true. But I can assure you, being at one with God doesn't look like you're insane, ever. In fact, everyone will think you're the most sane person I've met when Actually, you're at one with God. Actually, I just said that because of being polite. I still very much believe that I'm at one with God. Yes, you actually believe yes. you are already here. Yeah. And, and in our previous conversation, I said to you that you weren't and that you were also heavily overcloaked by some spirits. Now, you don't want to believe that and that's okay. You're allowed to not accept what I say to you. The reason for that is, the, is that I feel a lot more comfortable in the outside world and everything is just, per, you know, and with you giving me the, the, the divine love part, uh, know the truth I changed a few things around everything just worked for me so nicely it's just everything is falling into place for me so can you see I can, can I just say something to every person who's heavily overcloaked by spirits who things fall into place for very easily things are falling into place for you because you have some spirits hooked into you who want everything to fall into place for you on the divine love path, your law of attraction will be paramount and things will not fall into place with you without you dealing with an unhealed emotion. D do you see the difference? Like one is the overcloaked state where spirits want to maintain a connection with you and they will do anything to establish a beachhead inside of you. And what I mean by that is if you just imagine for a moment is here's your soul, right? Here's your soul. 
And here's your soul uninfluenced by others. So this is your, just your soul, your own emotions, your desires, your passions, your longings and everything else. Now how does a spirit get to live his life vicariously through you? How does he do that? Well, what he does first is he establishes a, a, an area in your soul where you trust him or her. Right? Now, now, if I'm a spirit who's a negative spirit, this is what I will do with you. I would establish an area inside of your soul where you come to trust me. Right? And that, that area might be just one little thing within the soul. For example, I might tell you little secrets that nobody else knows, for example. Does that make sense? And I just drop, oh, there's this thing, there's this thing about that person, there's this thing about this person. I go, hmm, hmm. And all of a sudden my pride is starting to rise because I'm starting to see that I can see things about other people they can't see about themselves. And now this spirit has put a beachhead, if you like, in my soul. And what he will do is this spirit will keep working on that, working on that, until he can get or she can get her needs vicariously met through through my passions and desires. So the beachhead might be any unhealed emotion that I have inside of myself. So, and one very large one, by the way, that we've been talking with quite a lot of different people about is pride or arrogance. Can you see that I'm already at one with God, right? Or I'm insane or I'm overcloaked. Like, it's quite an arrogant position, unless it's true. Right. So how? So is it true? To the, yes. So you feel you're at one with God. Absolutely. I don't know how I can get any better than that because I have. So you feel you are the best you can be. On this earth, on this earth, with the condition we have on this earth. Uh, yes, I am. And, and I disagree I'm with you totally. I'm full of myself. Well. <laughs> I'm sorry, I must be full of it. Yeah, I, I don't even deny it. I just can't I, I just I just can't see how you can get any closer to God on earth. On it's earth no uh, different. because the earth is not like the spirit world. It's no different. It's no different here or in the spirit world. But we have to live here with all different soul condition at once, where when yeah. we go up in the spirit world, but at least we're together with our own kind. But, but that doesn't make any difference to your own condition. You can be at one with God here on earth, just like you can be at one with God in any position in the spirit world, right? And go to but that. But if no person annoys you, and you actually feel sorry for the ones who actually would have been or annoyed you or say even but three can months I just, ago. But can I just illustrate to you, right now you are being unloving to the rest of this group. Okay. You are not at one with God. Can I explain to you how you're being unloving to the rest of the group? You are grabbing hold of a personal matter which we could have discussed privately and you have already previously had the opportunity to discuss with me privately. Yes, you have. It was just two weeks ago, if you remember, or th four weeks ago, somewhere in that time period, we've had a personal chat about this particular issue, right? And you're grabbing 100 people and dragging them into this discussion when it's about your life. Would you do that if you're at one with God? I'm ter terribly sorry, I do apologise. I'm no, I'm not, I'm yes. not saying it to shame you. I apologise because obviously I'm totally off track and I no, maybe see, no, am insane. I'm sorry. Can you just stop for a moment? The question I asked you was, would you do that if you were at one with God? That's the question. I'm not trying to shame you or put you down or any of those things. It's just a simple question of a yes or no, with a yes or no answer. Like, would you believe that you're at one with God while you've imposed that a hundred people or 80 people, whatever people are here, listen to this personal discussion when you have already had the opportunity to have the personal discussion with myself and I have already given you the answer that I feel. Can you see that dragging everyone else into it is not a loving thing? I've never said that before, AJ. 
I, I, when, when the conversation started, you and I asked you if I can have the email address of David. And then you took me aside and then you told me that I'm absolutely, totally overcloaked by low spirits. I then went back and cleared myself and Elaine said to me, actually those spirits, I can't feel that they're so bad. Then I went home, went totally back and, uh, in the conversation. Can you, can you see you're still doing it? Can you see it's still happening? Like, and can like this is what I'm saying to you is that by pursuing it like you are, you are demonstrating your condition. Allow yourself to see it. You will just see see how you're doing it again. Like, <laughs> if you just if you can just listen for a moment, right? This state. And this state and this state don't look the same. This state is very, very different to these two states. Being at one with God is very different to being overcloaked and being insane. Right? And you loaded a question with me because you already felt this is where you are. So by asking me the question, you're, you already feel you have the answer. And how difficult is, is it for me then to tell you something different when you believe you already have the answer to the question that you're asking. Like, a, can you see it's not even a sincere question? And, and would a loving person ask an insincere question? Can, can you see that a loving person wouldn't do that? Now, if you're at one with God, you would already be loving, so therefore you would never ask an insincere question and you wouldn't demand that, that 80 people listen to the response either. Does that make sense? And so, so if you just look at that, you'll be able to see that this is not true. It's a belief that these spirits that are with you have about themselves. They believe you are, they are, by the way, that's how they see it, they believe they are at one with God. They believe it. And they have caused you, through their influence, to also believe it. And I'm saying to them, just as much as I'm saying to you, is they are not at one with God because they would never do these unloving things if they were. Does that make sense to you? So this isn't an attack. This is just exposing the, what's really there inside of yourself. Now, you can go along with what I've just said or you can totally reject it. That is your choice. Does that make sense? So allow yourself to make those choices, whether you want to go along with it or reject it. But, but I'm saying to you, and I've already given you my opinion, that this is the condition that, that you are in. And the spirits with you believe they are in this condition. They believe they're there. So, of course, anybody else who comes along to do any work with you about spirits is going to say, yeah, they don't seem too bad to me. Because the spirits themselves believe they're at one with God. No, it's not impossible for them to be at one with God, but I'm saying to you that the spirits who are with you are not at one with God, just as you are not, because they are just as unloving with you as, as you are with this group. Right? They have dominated your life. They have controlled almost everything you do. So how is that loving? That is not loving, you see. They believe they are there, but they are not. You see, a spirit who's at one with God would not do that to you. They would not control your life like this. They wouldn't dominate you. They wouldn't pump you full of information constantly like these spirits are doing to you all the time, which you know is happening. right? And they wouldn't do that if they were at one with God. If they were at one with God, they'd be encouraging you to find your own desires and live your own life in harmony with love and truth. The truth is the spirits with you are not at one with God and you aren't either. And I'm not saying that to pull you down, I'm just saying the truth of the matter. Just allow yourself to see that when I have unloving behaviour, demanding behaviour, pushy behaviour, all of those kind of behaviours, then I am not being loving. And these spirits with me are motivating me into these actions, which means they themselves are not loving either. Right? And I need to be able to see that and feel that and then I'll maybe start looking at why I'm allowing this and remember I discussed with you one of the reasons why you allow this in private do you remember I discussed it with you 
can I just say, say something? When I had my discussion with you, I felt that you would barely even remember my discussion because I could also feel at the time that these spirits who were influencing you right, to believe what you believe about yourself don't, didn't want to hear a single thing of what I was saying to you. Right? And they still don't want to hear a single thing right, of what I'm saying to you. Because to, if they hear it, and worse still, if you hear it, right, then you'll start questioning your relationship with them. And if you start questioning your relationship with them, what happens to them? They then start going down, well, I've got no one to influence anymore. What, what's going to happen to us? They get all worried and upset. The truth is that they can progress too, but they don't think of that. They've been with you all of your life. They're going to, like, they're going to want to still maintain control of you. And this is why you can't often remember even conversations that you've had with people because you didn't have them. They did. They had them with those people. Does that make sense? Well, I, I don't know. I, I wouldn't agree with that, that they did a good job to get you through life because the, the reality is they've actually influenced a lot of your life negatively through this process as well. You would have been far better off having, having had no one influence your desires, no one influence your passions, and you being able to remember every conversation you have with people to a fair degree, rather than having whole blanks of your life that you can't even remember as a result of their influence. Does that make sense? And that would have been far better for you. So, so my feelings are what they're doing to you is very unloving, but they don't believe themselves to be unloving because they believe themselves to be in this state. They believe that they're doing exactly what they should be doing. Right? Does that make sense? And what's happened is the spirits for yourself and for most people, they get a beachhead on our soul and once they've got that beachhead, once that beachhead gets fully established, they will then kick in their real desires, whatever those real desires are. So if their real desires are to enter into a needy transaction with you constantly, which is what these spirits are doing, getting you to live out their life that they didn't live, right? what they're trying to do is stay with you the rest of your life so that they can live out the life that they had cut short in their, in their history. And, what, and what, that's their desire with you. That doesn't feel like such a bad desire, but it has harmed you. There are others that, you know, they hook in to this person, get a beachhead, and then all of a sudden they turn them to drugs, you know, drugs are the thing, and bang, and you get see the person just almost switch from one thing into another. I've seen people change their entire lives in a moment in a negative direction just from a spirit's influence. For example, young, a young man who's recorded in the uh, book um, 30 Years Among the Dead, if you ever read that, um, there's a young man there, up until 17 years of age, he hated the thought of war and going into an army or navy or any of those things. He was a, uncon he was a what do they call him, a conscientious objector. This was back in <coughs> the 20s. And yet in one day, he left his job and enrolled in the navy for three years. And they actually found a spirit overcloaking him in that place. But what had happened first is the spirit makes a beachhead in the soul of the person and then motivates the person to do something that they wouldn't normally do through that connection. Does that make sense? And this is what to, to, happens to a lot. How do, I get, how do I get rid of them after having them for the whole life? How do you get rid life? of them? Yeah. Well, you first look at your desire to have them with you. There is always, remember, a hook. So if you think of it like a fish hook that you have, right, into them. You have a hook into them. What is your hook into them? That's the question you've got to start asking yourself. Now, one of your hooks into them is that your life seems pretty smooth and easily maintained while they're connected to you. Do you imagine what your life's going to be like without that? It's going to be perhaps bedlam. You don't know, right? So, so one of the addictions inside of you is they give me a sense of control. Right? They give me a sense of power over my own life, a sense that I've got everything down pat, a thing that I've got everything solved. They give me that sense. 
So that's your hook into them. So what's that hook? That hook is really a fear that you personally don't have everything in control and you need their assistance to have it all in control. And, and these are the hooks, and I'm just giving a, an example of one hook that you have into the spirits who are overcloaking you. And the only way to deal with it is to deal with the hook, to deal with the reason why you want them with you. There's a reason why you want them with you. And, you, and there's more than one, by the way, reasons. And you need to pray about it and find out those reasons. Does that make sense? Thank you very much. And the same applies to any person who has influence with spirits. You know, and that applies to people who are schizophrenic. It applies to people who have manic depression because these are all spirit-influenced conditions. And, there, and also people who are highly mediumistic who swing very rapidly from one condition to another condition, back to another condition and so forth. Have a look at your hooks into these spirits. What is driving your connection with them? Why do you want them so much in your life? Have a look at that because it's, it's why you want them so much in your life that allows them to establish a beachhead in your soul and manipulate and control you and move you around. No? Um, what's the difference between a spirit attaching to you because I know I've got this real fear spirit here or whatever, Sorry, I don't know, a, a spirit. fear which I know is a spirit yep. influence and overcloaking. Um, there isn't too much difference oh, okay. in a lot of ways but yeah. um, because the spirit who, who you can feel is a part of your fear so you, you know that you have fear of your own mm -hmm. and this spirit is with you because it feels a rapport, mm -hmm. uh, she, she feels a rapport with you and so, so she feels like she's got a lot of fear as well. So when you start to try to confront some of your fears, it goes into panic quite rapidly because yeah. it's not only your fear to get over now, but it's hers as well. So what is your hook into a woman who's afraid? You see, she's just a woman who's afraid. The spirit with you. Yeah. Yeah. Is just a woman who's afraid. What's your hook into afraid women? Well, that was my mother's whole life was a, was fear, and yep. and yeah. I right from when I was born, I know that I was in fear and terror because. My but mother that's not your hook. Okay. But you you're close to the hook. Pleasing mum is your hook. Disapproval of others has been really, you know. In other like words, yeah, thing. you're you're avoiding the feeling of disapproval from mum. Yeah. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So uh, this allows a woman who is in an afraid state to connect with you and then push you around and manipulate you. Yeah. And, and when you release the emotion of needing to please mum, which is a flip side emotion from, I feel if I don't please somebody that they're going to get angry and upset with me, right? then you've now, you've now got your hook. You now know what's hooking you with the spirit. When you release the hook of the spirit, the spirit's fear will no longer affect you. I just didn't follow that. I just couldn't hear what you said. And you notice that? You notice yeah. everything, and this is something to bear in mind, every single time I give an answer about the hook that I've given to a person about spirit influence, mm. in almost every occasion they don't hear what I'm saying. Mm. On almost every occasion, Ed, who do you think influences that? The, the spirit. spirit yeah. Now, why would the spirit want, not want to know that? Want you to know that? <laughs> because, because by releasing the hook, they no longer can influence you. So, of course, they don't want you to know it. Can you see that? Yeah. They don't. They don't. They don't care, really. In the end, they, they don't want you to know what's going on. And this is why whenever I give you an answer and you go tune out, mm -hmm. that's a heavy indication that there's a spirit with you who's hearing this answer and doesn't like what they're hearing. Does that make sense to everyone? What I said to you was okay. the pleasing mum emotion. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. This emotion you have inside of yourself that you've got to please mum, otherwise what will happen? I what? won't be loved. Or you won't be loved. You won't... Yeah. Like she, she will just reject you if you don't please her, right? This pleasing mum emotion is your hook into this woman spirit who's afraid. Yeah. Does that make sense? So she's an older woman 
like your mum, with very similar emotions to your mum, mm -hmm. and your hook into her is you've got to please her, I've got to please her, I've got to please her. So when you start dealing with your fear, are you pleasing her anymore? No. No, it's a, it's a terrible, terrible struggle. Every bit of fear that I have is such a struggle. That's it. Now I am connected. You know, like, my, my mother never loved me anyway, so it didn't work. So, so what's happening is that this woman wants you to please her, just like your mum wanted you to please her. And when you allow yourself to work through the pleasing mum emotion, the reason, the feeling that you have with mum that you never did please her, and that you always were struggling to please her, and the grief that you have about that, you will automatically release this hook between yourself and this spirit. And then you'll be able to deal with some of the fear that's in you. Right? But at the moment, she is adding to your fear. Whenever you get afraid, she gets you more afraid and helps you live in the fear, yeah. which doesn't help you move forward. And it's physical, like I feel it all the time. Yep, she will impress it upon your body, like you're going to suffocate and die type oh, yeah. feelings. Like yeah. she's, she's, she's impressing, don't you go there, don't you go there, don't you go there, just like your mum was, by the way, but that's not your hook into her. Your hook into her is the desire to please mum because if you don't please mum, you don't get loved. So your hook into the spirit is you want somebody, an older woman, to love you and care for you. Uh, that's your hook into the spirit. Mm. Does that make sense? Now that, that is similar to, to being overcloaked in a way, but overcloaked is, is, a, is a much more intense thing where, where we, have, we, we tune out of our own body so much that now the spirit is using our body to interact with others. Right? That's what I mean by overcloaking. So what's happening with yourself is more an emotional injury that's hooking a spirit into you. And that once that emotional injury is dealt with, the spirit will separate from you. Overcloaking is an emotional injury still of wanting to get out of my own body, get out of my own life. And what happens is the spirit takes over my body and expresses itself through my body. Many of you have heard of those as like walk-ins or whatever. Um, many, there are many examples. I read out the example um, a few months ago of, um, what was his name? Um, David Hawkins. Um, yeah, where he described the entire process of when he went away from his own body and was overcloaked. So overcloaking is when you don't even remember yourself anymore. And now somebody else is really guiding you. Now, sometimes that switches in and out, but a lot of times people have had their whole lives taken over. I know of people who, who have had their entire life change in one moment and everyone's viewed it around them as, oh, they've gotten God somehow. Mm -hmm. And in reality, what they've gotten is a spirit now overcloaking them completely. Right? And that's a very different state to your state at the moment. So do... So do um are you saying that I can just go straight into feeling grief about my mother not loving me, which I've done a little bit of, but obviously not enough. I go straight there. I don't have to go through that trying to feel the fear first. Yeah, look at, look at everything in your life where you're trying to please women. Look at every, every single time you're drawn into pleasing a woman when you don't really want to do it. There's quite a lot of those times, right? <laughs> <laughs> so look at those because that's just that's telling you that you're yet to heal the emotion inside of yourself with your mum yet. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's your law of attraction telling you. Yeah. So every time you're drawn into pleasing this woman, pleasing that woman, pleasing this woman, like, and it's something you don't want to do yourself, mm. and, and even if it is, I'd be even looking at the times when you do want to do it actually because... <laughs> Because there's an automatic assumption almost inside of yourself that you have to. Yeah. And, and look at and release the underlying reason for the emotion, which is, if I don't do this thing for this person, they're they not going to love me. Love me. Mm. They're not going to be my friend anymore. Mm. They're not going to, you know, do, give me a feeling I want. Yeah, yeah that, I never it. say, I never ever express my wants. I always... You know, yeah, you when you wants. walk into a room with a group of women in particular, with men it's a bit different. You often do start expressing what you want, <laughs> uh, more so than with women. But when you walk into a group of women 
um, you just sit in the background a lot of the times waiting for them to all express what they want and then you just agree with the one that's closest to what you want. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's what you did with your mum. Exactly the same thing. So <coughs> just look at that because that's what's hooking you into the spirit who's, who's impressing your... When you get into your fear, this spirit's just controlling a lot of your mm. interactions in that mm. place. Yeah. So, so often... And I guess this is the same thing. I'll be trying to do some processing and I'll just start thinking about something else. Like, you know, yep. just gone. And that's, that's you know, the like spirit? Gone. Influencing your processing of emotion. Yeah. Because when you touch an emotion, it's a bit like when you... You can imagine yourself here and your mum sitting or standing right next to you. Imagine that for a moment. I feel like she's just there, actually. Yeah. <laughs> she's passed. Yeah. Yep. Now... If, you're, if your mum's right here next to you and you're here, every time you start to deal with an emotion and particularly an emotion relating to mum, can you see that if your mum is right next to you and doesn't want you to feel that, she's going to heavily impress upon you, don't do that. Mm. Now on earth she might have even smacked you for doing it or might have controlled you in some way. For well, doing she it. screamed it a lot. Screamed, screamed at you a lot, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you learn to do what the woman wants, what the angry woman wants. Yeah. Right? And so when you walk into a room, you automatically have a radar. That woman's angry, that woman's angry, that woman's angry, that woman's angry. Right? And automatically you feel drawn to those people. You either stay out of their way mm -hmm. or if an interaction comes to you, you know straight away that if you don't do what pleases them, you're going to be in trouble. Mm -hmm. And so you do what pleases them instead. And this is the same emotion that is your hook into these spirits. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yep. If we go Jean first, and then. Oh, so can we go at the back first? Sorry, because you've had your hand up for some time, I know. Thanks, Edgy. But I was just wondering, you know, in terms of when you say you don't need help at all, for instance, this morning, now this is amazing walk for climate change, and I just think there were a huge number of people that were there that needed to influence a lot of the politicians. If you say we don't need help, sometimes, you know, we look at change and we see grassroots movements that change a whole dynamic um, to make a really um, healthy, better planet. So how does that fit in with these? All right, well, my comment still stands. You personally do not need help to become at one with God. Right? However, I never said that help wasn't good. Did I? I said you don't need help. What I was talking about earlier was having a demand for help. Right. right? Now, when we demand other people to help us, now we're in a very unloving state. And in an unloving state, we can create a lot of unloving things. Right? So, every, so if I demanded that you come for a walk with me on the climate change issue, now I'm being unloving because I'm not honouring your free will. Space. Yeah, and if, if I said, oh, I'm going for a walk uh, for climate change this morning, you want to come with us? And you had the choice, yeah. and then when you made your choice and your choice was no, yeah. I didn't go, mm, you, you know, what, you know, and project a heap of things at you or tell you off or what are you doing then and get all upset and all those things because that just tells you that I had a demand, right? Once, once we don't have the demand and we're just in a loving space, now, yes, whatever we do together and with help, is going to grow, we're going to grow immensely. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and in, the truth is that all of us are receiving a tremendous amount of help. What I'm saying is when you demand it, now we're out of harmony with love and you can't actually receive help from loving people when you're demanding that help. So, so God will not help you while you're demanding of God, right? God will help you when you're longing for God. There's a big difference between those two states. And don't expect other people around you to help you when you're demanding of them. right? Because dem being demanding of them is not loving. If you just pass the mic across, it's the same issue. Well, it's a point of clarification. Uh, you just need the mic. <laughs> it's a point of clarification. Yeah. Um, is it that God's not helping us or we're not actually open to God helping us? Yeah, that, that is very true. The, the truth is that God's always trying to assist us. But 
but while we're in a demanding state, we automatically block assistance. That's a, that, that's a part of the soul. So, 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 so like, as soon as you go into a demanding state, the demanding state is an angry state, right? As soon as you go into a demanding state, this is what you're doing to your soul with God. You're putting a helmet over your soul and nothing is going to enter it from God in that state. And we're doing that to our own soul, which prevents God from influencing our soul. Yep, yep. Um, down here we are next time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello. Far away. I'm listening. <laughs> uh, I have. Yeah, I, I, I come. I come more across that I, I'm pretty spirit attached. And uh, there's just, I just, when I was at Sanctuary, I just, there were two very strong spirits with me. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know how to, I, I know I, I have to go in my grief. It has a lot to do with my father. He did a lot of damage in my childhood in my, to my soul. Mm -hmm. And I've, and they, what, what do you feel? What gender, they protected me. What is, gender are the spirits? They're males? Yeah. And they protected me from, and I feel they don't want me to go in that, it's a big, big, how you call it, a, 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 a beach hat. Yep. And, and they don't want me to go there. And yep. it's really, and. But, but again, the key is to focus on your hook. So here's you. Yeah. And, and you've got some two big, strong male yeah. spirits with you, right, who who set themselves up as protectors. Yeah, because I almost died once in a, in a car accident and I feel they protected me. Yeah. And so I, I, have, I probably have made a deal with them and, and I came to, I feel betrayed. I How feel, can you be betrayed? The I, law I of attraction is perfectly yeah. at work. And the feeling of betrayal here is not an emotion you need to process because it's not really an emotion at all. Okay. The truth is that you want them in your life. Yeah. And this is something very important to understand with all spirit interactions. We want them there. If we didn't want them there at the soul level, they could not be there. Mm. Right? They couldn't even exist there if we didn't want them there. So there has to be a longing for them here. So, yeah. so here's, here's you, your emotions. So your big emotion is the male has to do what? Protect me. It seems like protecting me. And makes me safe. Makes me safe, yeah. How many of you ladies have the same emotion? Quite a few actually. More than what put up their hands. Okay, so the male protects me and keeps and makes me safe. What that does is attract these spirits mm. to you. Now, why do I feel I need the male's protection? It feels like a survivor. I can't survive with a, right, it. So it feels these like the, I'm dying. I cannot survive I is cannot what you said, survive. yeah? I'm dying. I, I, I cannot survive. So you can't Which is survive? not the truth. Actually. No, it's not the truth. It's not the truth. Not the truth. I, know I survived all my life. Okay. But there is something, huh? and I, I cannot survive. I That's the feeling you have? Yeah. Yep. I feel like okay. it's the feeling. And you've had a German background, haven't you? Yes. Your parents in the Second World War? Yes. Yep. And a lot of this comes from I that, know. I've, I've seen it too. Now, now let's, let's just take this a little way along. What is my hook into these spirits? You see, these spirits, every single time you come to deal with a certain emotion of grief, these spirits won't want you to deal with their grief because their whole purpose is to protect you from your yeah. grief. And I'm, I'm trying, every night I'm trying, and I pray to God, please uh, help me to go in that grief. And, and I get a little glimpse and it stops. I Can I suggest you change your prayer a little? You don't want to feel your grief. So you'd be, you'd be better off praying to God, I could say that. please show me the reason why I don't want to feel my grief, mm. rather than praying for God's help mm. to feel your grief. I came to that conclusion. Does that, does that make sense? So, so my desire to stay away from my grief 
So your desire to stay away from grief is your hook into them. Your belief that they should protect you from any grief. Your desire to stay away from your own grief is your hook into them. So what you need to do is focus on why you want to stay away from grief. What beliefs do you have? I came to to that... Um, okay, my, my father always told me I'm nothing. No, no, I'm, no, I'm, no, not, no. no. Let's not blame anyone else around us for the beliefs we have. Let's just go into what belief I have. What are your beliefs you have? And they, By the way, when you make statements about beliefs, the belief statements are things like, and the feeling along with it is, I feel this. Not why. We don't need to know really why, do we? We just need to know what, what we feel. So, so what is the feeling? Why do we have this feeling that we should stay away from grief? What's going on inside of me that causes me to stay away from grief? What, do you, what beliefs do you have about... What are you, feelings do you have about grief? It's not allowed. So it's not allowed. <coughs> what will happen if you feel grief? I die. Do you feel you're going to die? Yeah. I die. I die. Is that I'm, it? Yeah, I die. That's the biggest one. Yeah. I'm going to die I if die. I feel grief. Yeah. yeah. And it's that, And it's that feeling inside of you that keeps these spirits yeah. with you. While you have that feeling inside of you, these spirits will remain with you, trying to protect you from your grief. So, so it's not a truth, is it? No, it's not a truth. But it is mm, something it that is, you believe yeah. in here mm. as true. Mm. It's something you feel is true, that you will die. Mm. All right? So what you need to do is start allowing yourself to feel that feeling. And that's a feeling of terror, isn't it? Complete terror. Yeah. And you need to pray that's to God about that terror that you're going to die. Just when I say the terror, really. So that's what that's what I would focus on. Just focus on that emotion. When you focus on the emotion that causes the hooks, the beauty of focusing on those particular emotions first is that it releases the hook and therefore releases the spirit influence, and now you can get into the emotion better. Does that make sense? But if you're, if you're not focusing on the motion, you're trying to get around. So you try to get around that. So how would you try to get around that? You'd go, oh, but I know I'm not going to die. You tell yourself a message here that you don't feel is true here. But, but you try to tell yourself, I know, that, you know, I know all of this stuff that we don't know in our soul. And that's the reason why we try to circumnavigate the feeling. We need to feel this feeling for it to be released. That's going to mean probably laying down in your bed or something like that, um, get, watching a movie, Trigger or Two movie, that yeah. you're going to die, you know, some kind of Second World War type movie or something like that. Yeah. yeah. And then lay down in your bed and just allow yourself to feel terrified and pray to God to just stay in the state of terror until it's done and it releases from you. That's, that's how it releases. Does that make sense? Yeah. You can use a mic still. Yeah, it does make sense. <laughs> That's good. Okay, thank you. And it's that hook that causes these spirits to Terrorist. rush to you. They just rush to your aid. That's their role. They feel they're helping you. you yeah, okay. They can feel from you that you're going to die. That's how you feel. You're going to die if you, you feel this grief. So that they feel, oh, we don't want her to die. We're going to look after her. We're going to be her protectors. We're going to love her and care for her. And because help. I almost died once. Yes. And that when I was 15, 16, and I wanted to die because yep. there was so much terror in my family. Yep, yep. That's it. And you, you can connect with this terror. You can connect with it. Remember that God is with you while you go through these things. And while you stay open like you are now to the terror... God can actually help you in that state. That's when God can help you to release the emotion. Now, I've had lots and lots of terror to deal with in my life. 
and, and I've had some pretty scary things happen to me in the process of dealing with my terror in my life, right? So, so you can get through these things. Like I've had my whole body locked up in, a, in contortion like cramp for hours at a time dealing with my terror, like feeling my terror and releasing it, just breathing. And the thing with terror, always breathe diaphragmatically. Don't stop breathing. Which you had stopped doing. <laughs> Just keep breathing, keep breathing. <coughs> See, and, and you'll get through that terror. When you get through that terror, these spirits will go, huh, she looks like she can cope with anything now. We don't need to be with her. And they'll probably go and find another woman who needs their help, perhaps, because that's their addiction. They are addicted to doing that. Does that make sense? So that's their addiction. But we hook into their addiction through our addiction whatever that is. Thank you. No worries. If we can have a mic. Is there a second mic? Yeah, there it is. coming up there. Thanks. Hi, AJ. G'day. Um, AJ, I've, I've sort of written a bit down because I think I'm going to get confused with this. Um, I've got a, a lot of memory loss and um, like from childhood certainly lots of blanks I don't remember anything for lots long of blanks of, of your time. childhood are you saying yep. lots yeah yep. but I'm also getting blanks now so it's it's um right uh, getting Do, a lot when of you say you're getting blanks are they blanks about short term or long term both both yeah okay I get short term but I also had a, a 12 hour complete blank just a few months ago where I don't have any memory of the day at all Right. So that kind of thing's uh, um, happening quite a so, bit. But you've survived that day, obviously. Like oh, absolutely. I was with a girlfriend, so she kind of recognised what was going on, but I don't have any memory of anything that happened that day right. at all. So that's so, what I would call over being overcloaked. That's what I'm wondering. Yep. Um, and is that hook, is the, is the hook that's keeping me overcloaked, is that my desire not to remember my, what happened when I was blank in my childhood? Okay. Just, I know probably the same process needs to happen anyway. Either way, I need to just continue working with that terrace um, stuff. But Yes. Um, um, the, the danger you have is if you leave it too much longer, you will start getting Alzheimer's as a result. I am already I've got white spots. I've had um, yeah. scans and I've got lots yeah. of stuff happening there. So, yeah. So the, the, key, the key is to actually start allowing yourself to emotionally remember your childhood. Now, now um, the way you do that is you don't need to remember the events so much as allow yourself to remember the traumatic situation, uh, the traumatic feelings in your childhood. Yeah. And that's, that's the way your memory closes down. The way your memory closes down is by us trying to deny the emotion from the traumatic event and then eventually the memory of the event also disappears. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Um, so the, the, the opposite process needs to happen, and that is open up to the trauma in your own childhood uh, as a feeling. And when you open up to the feeling, the memories will start coming back to you. But in your brain, what actually does happen is parts of your brain start getting destroyed through the desire to actually not have the emotion. And that's a very, your, your, your whole soul is very powerful and has the ability to completely destroy your brain, actually, if you don't want to feel emotion. And that happens over a period of time for many, for many people. That's obviously. interesting. I've been given the opportunity lately to work with a guy who has dementia in a dementia ward. And of course, it's just perfect timing because it's just really, yeah. yeah, yeah. And yeah. I've ta uh, for years, I've worked with all sorts of herbs and things, of course, on a physical level to just try and get the circulation better, etc. But I know that's not the answer. Yeah. Um, yep. The key yeah. is to allow the emotional process to begin. So you will find when you allow the emotional process to begin, the memories won't come back straight away. It will take a bit of time. And the reason why is that you're, you're, as you deny emotion, it starts killing off different areas of your brain that prevents you from actually having your mind, your spirit body's mind, passing information to your brain. So all of your memories are actually in your spirit body's mind of your entire life. Um, and this is why people who get strokes can recover from strokes because, because part of the brain can die, but then, then another part of the brain will often start doing something in order to pick up the slack, if you like. 
but the problem is with these emotions is that while we're trying so hard to not emotionally remember, we're automatically try, trying to force the brain into a condition that's not its natural state. Yeah. Very, it's very damaging to us physically. So th those spirits that have overcloaked me are going to be much, as with every other problem, they're going to be um, less able to do that or will not want to be there once? Well, there's something else going on in the overcloaking period and that is in that moment there is something that's happening that you don't want to live through. Right? And that causes you to step away from yourself, to step out of body. So that would have happened when I was a child? Or uh, was I'd it? suggest it begun happening when you were a child. Yep. But, but you can begin by what's happening now. So you know that time that it happened a few months ago? What I would do there is, when did it begin on that day? Can you remember when it began? Yeah, early mo about nine o'clock. Nine o'clock in the morning? morning yeah. What I would do is I'd analyse everything that happened up until nine o'clock in the morning. And then I would look at what emotions in that was I, try were, were, was I trying to avoid. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. Because, yep. because at nine o'clock in the morning, you went out of body. Yeah. So you wanted to avoid your life so much by that stage that you went out of body, and when you go out of body, which is sort of like, almost like, sort of like sleep, like going to sleep almost. Um, but when you're in an awake state doing that, a spirit just steps in and controls the rest of the, controls your body until you want to come back into it again. And I've seen people take years, actually, be years out of body in that state, or just a few days, or just a few moments. Yep. You can do either. Yeah, I've yeah. always had a fear of that since I was young because I've always had this, you know, not um, tuning out stuff happening right through my life. So I was always frightened of dementia and that sort of thing. Yeah. Mm. So always look at what happened up until the point you left, because there's the emo the emotions are in there somewhere. The okay, emotions well, I, you're trying. I get a lot worse when I'm being when someone's with me who has a very acute, uh, fast, quick mind who might judge me, so I know that happens. I get terribly forgetful and stressed about what I might forget. <laughs> right, so when you're that. with what you judge to be an intelligent person who is clever, you have a tendency to go out of body then? Yeah, definitely, yep. yeah. Okay, so that, that's one area. So you're looking at the issue of you don't feel you're clever. The, the emotion is you don't feel you're clever and you need some spirit help to make you look clever. And they, they probably do make you look clever too. Okay, yeah. yeah. Sense. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah you lot. might say a lot of things you don't remember, but the people you were with probably remember them and think it was pretty good. <laughs> yeah. <All right. laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. Hi. Um, can we go back to the pride and arrogance thing? Because I know we've had that conversation before. And what's, what's underneath that in terms of the causal... What creates that arrogance and pride? Is it the same for everyone or is it a different hook? It's different for everyone. Okay. Um, sometimes it can come from deep feelings of unworthiness and things like that, that that we then try to work through by by portraying ourselves to be someone we're not. Mm. But the majority of the times it comes from actually one or both of our parents treating us like a princess or a prince. Yeah. Um, so, so in other words, one or both of our parents treated us a certain way so that we came to believe we deserve more than other people. And uh, that's where a lot of pride and arrogance actually comes from. We actually finish up believing we are more deserving than people around us. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you process that in terms of... You process that in the situation you're in. So whenever, whenever somebody treats you in a way that doesn't connect with your pride, what you do is you, instead of getting angry, which is what you would normally do, what you do is you allow yourself to sit with the grief of it instead. So not feeling special or not feeling... Yeah, they, like didn't, I, they didn't treat me like I was special. Instead of going, they didn't treat me like I'm special, which is really an anger projection, yeah. a, a demand upon them that they treat you like they're special, you go into, I'm not special. Mm -hmm. Allow yourself to feel the grief of you not being special. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right at that moment. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So or not listened to, or not wanted, or you know, it, there's quite a few different emotions, obviously. But yeah. yeah. So, because in, in my law of attraction, like I have a lot of people say, "Oh, you're wonderful," or this. Or this. Is, is that because I want to feel that? Because I didn't when I was little. Yep. Almost, okay. almost uh, every person who has issues of like uh, arrogance will constantly get 
uh, people complimenting them a lot. Yeah. On the divine love path, when you're in a state of truth, trust me, until we, uh, even when you're at one with God, you're not going to get complimented a lot. <laughs> the reason why is when you're in a state of truth, most people are going to be confronted with the truth you're in. So they're going to be in a state of error, you'll be in a state of truth you'll confront their error and for the majority of people they won't want to compliment you about that they'll just get angry with you about that does that make sense so so if you're receiving a lot of compliments and adulation right then have a good look at the emotion inside of yourself um, because most of the time it's a desire to feel prominent or have a position or whatever yeah, yeah. you'll notice um like in my, in my last six years of my life, I, I've probably had the most abuse that I've ever had in my life. Um, and when I say abuse, I mean people verbally abusive, people angry, people wanting to kill me even, people getting really upset with me constantly and all of those kind of things. And that, that comes with the territory of being, bringing yourself into more and more harmony with truth. The key is to focus on the feelings you have of, as a result of it. So, so, for example, if somebody's attacking me, if I get angry with them, then I want them to treat me nicely. I have an investment in them treating me nicely. As soon as I have an investment, that's a demand, and every demand is unloving. So my investment in you treating me nicely is an unloving demand that I place upon you. Also, my investment in you saying happy things about me is an unloving demand to have upon you. And actually, when you release that investment, you'll find that less and less people will say happy things about you. Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? Like, you'll find less people will say happy things about you. Yeah. And so what happens nowadays is not many people say happy things about me, right? except under certain circumstances, and that is when they feel grateful about hearing the truth, when they actually have a feeling. But again, usually they don't say it about me. They just thank me for what I gave them. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do you see the difference? Yeah. Yep. It's in, as you were talking, my ears started aching. And it's that, I know there's a spirit with me, and I don't know who it is or what, that, but, yeah. yeah. There's a it's, lady with you who doesn't want you to hear any of this, is there? Yeah. So who's and that, do you think? I feel like it's my mum's mum. Right. My grandmother. Yeah. And, and why, why does she not want? Because a lot of it came from her. Makes me angry that she won't leave me alone, as well. Like she sort of wants you to have an arrogant state, doesn't she? Yeah. She wants you to have this state where you. She views it as having a good opinion of herself, but it's actually there's there's a difference between having a good opinion of yourself compared to having an opinion that you are better than other people. <laughs> and what mm. she actually has is an opinion that she's better than other people, mm. and, and that's she, yeah. what she wants you to have. Right. So how do I, I just deal with... What's your hook into women? Well, that I want them to love me and like me. And so deal with the hook. Okay, so grieve around them not. Grieve around, if you are yourself and you honour yourself as a woman purely like for desires and passions, including your desires and passions to have your soulmate in your life and all those things, yeah, which yeah. your grandma doesn't like very much, by the way, <laughs> as an idea. She doesn't <laughs> like the concept of soulmates at all. And so, 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 you know, if you connect with those desires and passions, what's going to happen? A lot of the women around you are going to feel challenged, you know? Mm. They already feel a bit challenged by you, don't they? Mm. Yeah. My sister in particular. Yep. Yeah. And so what's going to happen when you fully embrace your desires? Yeah. Well, You're not going to have many women friends. Yeah. Can you see that? Yeah. For a while at least. Yeah. Unless they're real friends who would stick with you through the process. But, yeah. And that's your fear. Yeah. And that's your hook into yeah. grandma. Yeah. So once I start dealing with that, she won't influence. Yeah, and you need to have a chat with grandma really too. Just I've tried doing that. She's Dutch and I've asked like divine love spirits to come down and talk Dutch to her. So yeah, but <laughs> Does that work? It's not a matter of whether she's Dutch or not. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the issue of her, her arrogance. Okay. She doesn't but, believe anybody can tell her anything she doesn't already know. Yeah. Does that okay. make sense? Yeah, yeah. And so for her, listening to a divine love spirit's like, why should I listen to them yeah, for? Right, okay. I already know more than they know. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. So. Would processing anger, that's no point really, is there? Yeah, to be frank, processing anger, you do need to feel your anger, anger, but processing anger doesn't get you anywhere near a causal emotion. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So you do need to feel your anger, but go through it into what's deeper. And what's deeper is fear, and then what's deeper than that is yeah. grief. So allow yourself to get from the angry stage into the fear stage. Yeah. See, most, most people don't want to do that. Most, what most people want to do is they want to stay in anger or get to their grief, <laughs> but they don't want to go through their fear. And that's the reason why we're angry, because we don't want to go through the fear. We don't want to feel the terror. The terror feels terrible, and, ter and bad and we feel like we can't handle our terror and so we don't want to go through it. So what we try to do every time is it's a bit like here's our emotions, here's the grief that we have, whatever the grief is about, here's the terror we have or the fear that we have that's on top of the grief and that produces our rage or our anger, right? Can you see that's the basic thing with most of our emotions. Now, our terror, by the way, the causal emotion might be shame or some other emotion as well, right? Not just grief. All of them will have grief associated with them in some way. But what happens a lot of the times is we're protecting our terror by using anger. So when I'm processing anger, am I really doing anything to our causal emotion, which is this emotion here? Not really, am I? What I need to do is get to the reason why I'm so angry, which is always going to be a terror, a, a, a fear that I have that's causing me to, I'm trying to get away from this fear, I'm trying to get away from this fear, and instead I'm going into anger to get away from the fear. Does that make sense? So, so focus on what am I terrified of. Let yourself feel the terror itself. Uh, most people try to circumnavigate, they, go, want, they want to go from there, to there and jump that bit. <laughs> right. Now, by the way, women are more, more, have a more stronger predisposition to that than men. The reason why is men generally are taught that to be a man you've got to be able to handle your fear. You know, you, so men do a lot of fear-based things for this reason. You, know, you don't see too many racing car drivers that are women. It's not because they're not capable of driving a racing car. Right? It's because many women are afraid of their terror. They don't want to feel their terror. They are afraid of it. So, so allow yourself to not try to jump through your terror, around your terror, and go through your terror to access your grief. When you're willing to do that, anger will be something that's rarely, if ever, in your life. Does that make sense to everyone? Like, if anger is in your life on a regular basis, it's because you're unwilling to feel what you're terrified of. Pass the Michael. Hi, AJ. Um, I'm actually in terror right now. Um, um, I've been wanting to get on the mic for a long time. Get off the path? No, get on to the mic to onto ask the a mic. question. Okay, yeah. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm not hearing you very clearly for some reason. I just... Sorry. This, uh, that better? This is quite terrifying for me, so. Um, but what I was wondering was, before, like we know that when we step into our desire, things generally move along in, in quite an orderly fashion for us and things just happen and, and like fall into place. Yep. But you were saying also that, that spirit can actually um, influence to make things look like they're falling into place well for you. Yep. So how then do you know whether you're actually, you know, things are happening because you're really in your desire or because it's spirit influence? Good question. This is how you know. When your desires are in harmony with love and truth, whatever happens as a result of that is going to be good for you. Right? But whenever your desires are out of harmony with love, so, so this is 
Harmony here. So this is harmony with love and truth. <clears throat> when they're in disharmony with love and truth. Now what can happen is spirits can influence you in some way. Now what often happens with spirit influence is this. They use your desires that are in harmony with love and truth that also are mixed with some desires that are out of harmony with love and truth in order to establish a beachhead in your soul. Right? Now if you can imagine yourself being a spirit for a moment and you notice that, you know, can I choose, uh, I'll choose Sue as an example if you like. So do you mind me mentioning some of your personal emotions? Okay. So, so I'm looking at Sue as a, as a spirit. I'm going, hmm, like Sue's got a really strong desire to know the truth about God. Like I can see that. So, so let's, let's say I'm a negative spirit and I'm looking at Sue. Right? So I, and I, I'm only ever looking at things from a perspective of what I can use. Does that make sense? I'm not concerned about Sue's welfare, her long-term life, her long-term soul condition or anything like that. All I'm interested in is how can I use Sue for my advantage? All right, so I can see she's got a desire for God in her. I can see she's got a desire for truth in her as well. Uh, I can see on this side, so this is positive things that I can see, but I don't see them as positive. I'm just looking the, at them from the point of view, I'm a spirit, looking at it from the point of view, how can I manipulate her? Right? Things that I can see that are, let's call this, actually, instead of positive and negative, let's call this things that are harmoni harmonious with love. And on this side, there's things that are disharmonious. Right. Haven't given myself much room there, but... All right, yeah, I can see. Oh, yes. Sue doesn't want to connect with her soulmate. Because she feels like she's going to get controlled by him. All right. So she has a fear of men's control. But she also wants to please powerful men. I can see that she wants that as well. Right. Yes, and she's feeling a bit shamed sexually as well. This side, is there any more things on this side we can feel from Sue? Uh, there's quite a lot actually, so I'm purposefully doing this. But there's quite a lot on the positive ledger. But see, they're going, ah, right, these are Sue's biggest desires, but I can see these emotions in her too. Right? Now, how can I establish a beachhead with Sue's soul, do you think? Can you see, it would make sense for me to probably work on the positive desires for a bit and help her sort of feel like she's getting somewhere with those, wouldn't it? And to come to trust me a bit, like in the process. So I'll help her. So I might, she might start doing automatic writing and I send her a lovely message about God. Right? And then she does a bit more writing because she was so imp impressed about the previous message about God. She writes another message and I send her a lovely message about truth, divine truth and everything. Now, I'm feeding her what, what, she, what she enjoys hearing that's harmonious with love and truth. But because she can't feel my soul, so this is the real problem, isn't it, in the end. If I can't feel the soul of the spirit who's influencing me, then I'm going to just trust what they say to me. Can you see that? Right? So, I'm, so I said a lovely message about God and a lovely message about truth and another lovely message about God. And, oh, it's all in harmony with divine truth and what I'm receiving. This must be a celestial spirit I'm talking to or it must be a spirit on the divine love path at least, right? 
No, it doesn't have to be. They're just saying words to you. Does that make sense? It might not be. But anyway, they're just saying it, they're saying it, so they're, you're writing it down and now you're feeling a bit of trust and rapport with them. And they're looking right at the same time they're doing that, they're looking, okay, how can I actually you know, you know, play around with Sue's life a bit? Oh, what I'll do is I'll lead her to a guru. Uh, I'll lead her to a guru who's also a bit sort of sexual with her, right? So that's, that's what I'll do. These are things that have happened in Sue's life. So I'll lead her to a guru who's a bit sexual with her, who projects sexually at her, or who feel, she feels she needs to please to feel like she's a good woman. Right? But all the time I'm also feeding her this stuff here. Can you see what it's going to do? Once I get the beachhead inside of Sue's soul, she's going to feel somehow this is involved with that. And she's actually going to start telling herself that actually whatever is happening here that feels unloving to herself is actually mustn't be loving, must be loving because this part is being fulfilled. Can you see that? And straight away it sets up this process of confusion. Now this has actually happened in Sue's life, hasn't it? Yeah. So, so that's how a spirit would work. How do you combat that? There is only one way really. And that is to feel the lovingness of the situation or the lack of love in the situation, in any situation. So, so when you began pleasing the powerful guru, how loving did you feel you were being to yourself at the time? You felt horrible inside of yourself. But you didn't trust it, did you? Because you were taught that this is all linked and you weren't trusting it. But if you trusted it, you would then, oh, hang on a no, 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 something's wrong here. I would have gone, oh, something's wrong here. Yeah, oh, something's happening here where I'm being led down a path that m is made to look loving, but actually is not, it doesn't feel loving to me, right? And, uh, and after a while you start to see, and if you keep trusting it, you'll start seeing the disharmony between those two things and seeing what's going on. Now, there's been spirits with Sue that have done exactly that to her. They've connected with her desire for God and desire for truth and then manipulated that through some of the other unhealed emotions and draw her to people who, they, who she spent a lot of her life with, um, helping and assisting and helping their movements grow and whatever else, but in reality had done a lot of personal harm to herself in the process. Right. And that's how they work. And isn't that pretty clever? Well, they don't want to get a life of their own. <laughs> the reason why they don't want to get a life of their own is because the life of their own is in the hells. Would you want that life? So wouldn't it be... So instead what they do is they come to earth as, much, as often as they can and try to influence something, someone vicariously so that they can feel some sense of enjoyment or pleasure. And by the way, there are many of them who have a complete enjoyment and pleasure in your destruction. Yeah, yeah. They, they want your soul to be shriveled up and dead by the time you pass. Right? That's how they want. Very dark, very dark. Very dark spirits who do this. But that's how they work. Now, if you know how they work, it's nothing to be afraid of. All you need to know is to feel like pray to God about the lovingness of each situation. And if you don't know what's loving in the situation, long for God, to, which is a prayer to God, isn't it? To show you what is loving in the situation. What is the loving thing here? What is the loving thing to do here? Am I in a loving space personally, firstly? And then secondly, what is what ha is happening to me loving as well? So, so for example... Is starving yourself a loving thing to do, do you think? But a lot of spiritual paths will encourage you to do that, won't they? Right? Some of them believe actually that not eating for a year is a proof of your own spiritual prowess. Some of them actually believe that. You need to use the mic. 
you can. The yeah. truth is, you can. Yeah. She, she wants to. This is even an Australian woman. Yeah, yeah. Right? You can live off yeah. prana. That is true. And she is a guru kind of. But I'm asking Europe. you whether it's loving, ah, yeah. right, to do that at the expense of your desires. So if you have a desire to eat some fruit, and then you're going, oh, you know, I'll live off prana instead, but you just had a desire to eat fruit, like. And is, li is eating fruit harmonious with love? Well, yes, it has a lot of rejuvenating effects on your body. Who knows, your body might actually need it at that moment. And your desire to stay in this other state might be driven by pride. In other words, a desire to prove to everyone around you that you're some spiritual guru or whatever. Now, the truth is you can live on nothing to eat. And, and who knows, many of you in the future may do that, right? But it will be from a desire place, not from a lack of it not from trying to suppress your desires. Except for mango season. Except for mango season, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think I'd agree with that one, actually. Yeah. Well, any fruit for me is. Yeah. So, so be, just be careful, because it's the, a lot of times, what, what will happen a lot of times is spirits will work on unhealed emotions, but connect with emotions that are actually good within you, and then manipulate that into an unloving event. <clears throat> so what happens is when you see the unloving events occur or if they're pointed out to you those unloving events have occurred then my suggestion is just to take stock for a moment you don't need to punish yourself you don't need to treat yourself badly you just go, whoa, what happened here? why was I led into this place? how did that happen? and allow yourself to feel about that and if you allow yourself to feel about it you will release the hook inside of you that caused it to happen. Does that make sense? And when you release the hook, they can never do it again with you. That's the beauty of releasing the hooks emotionally, is a spirit can never influence you again on that same issue. And the more hooks you release, the less influence you have. Now many of you in this audience have already noticed that in your own life, where you've had heavy influence in some way and then you've released a hook here and released a hook there, and all of a sudden, you feel fairly different in that process, right? And the key is to keep releasing those hooks until the point where you don't feel you have any hooks into the spirits. And now, if you're a medium, you can help them the most. And now if you're, but if you're not a medium and you're just processing yourself, and you can actually help yourself the most in that place as well. Would you like to have a break uh, for a half an hour or three quarters of an hour or something? Half an hour is long enough. <clears throat> no worries. Let's make it ten past four, shall we? <clears throat>